Welcome everyone. I'll, uh, as usual, give the announcements here at the beginning before we start the conversation. Eighty-two people in the pen. It's awesome. And here we go. Make sure I have all my settings here so I can see questions coming through. Welcome everyone. So this is Monday's ODZ Chat and Chill. I'm Taya Freestead. So I'm just gonna let the group know here. We have a big group of about 80 riders today. I'll let everybody know about the pace of the ride. All right, so we're gonna stay between one and a half and two watts per kilogram as usual. And I am super excited. We have a special guest today. Just start my other chat here. So with us today, we have Leah Thurvison. Hello. And I'm sure, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure everybody <laughs> knows Leah. But I will give a little bit of background. Leah, welcome. Thank you. So, Leah is a former U.S. Olympic trials marathon runner who was the winner of the 2016 Zwift Academy program. And Leah has just completed her first season as a pro cyclist with the uh, Kenyan SRAM team. And she has just... Uh, Resigned her contract for 2018, which is very exciting. She made her UCI Pro and World Tour debut this season. All of that within just two years of buying her first road bike. So, Leah, welcome again. Really, really excited and grateful that you have agreed to join the ride today. Happy to be here. <laughs> it's good to be up early. So, <laughs> yes, right? In the off season. So I guess you're taking a break for this week. I'm taking a break. Um, I didn't ride at all last week and I've told myself maybe a little bit on the cross bike, which I'm not a cycle cross racer, but I know it would be good for me. So I told myself maybe a little bit of that this week and this ride is an exception. So happy to have an excuse <laughs> to break the rules of the off season a little bit. <laughs> As long as I don't get a call from a med coach. <laughs> no, 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 you won't. <laughs> so, Leah, why don't we start with uh, you telling us how did you get into cycling in the first place? Just coming from a background as a runner, what, sure. what, uh, how did you start? Yeah. And I'll, um, I'll try to give the abbreviated version because that question alone can be a really long winded <laughs> response, but the, the short of it is, um, yeah, like you said, I was a competitive marathoner for a number of years and um, beginning in 2012, I started having some problems that resulted in four surgeries over the next three years. And um, I was still able to run. Um, the first one was a hamstring reattachment on my left leg and then the next three were all on my right knee. And the last one was a bone graft, which is they actually took a plug of cadaver bone and replaced a piece of bone in my femur because oh all my goodness. of like the, there was a massive defect on the end of my femur um, just from wear and tear. So um, that surgery requires that you do no high impact activity for a year and going from running 80 to 100 miles a week to nothing is enough to make you maybe think about losing your sanity. So um, 
I decided that, well, I actually had two surgeries that that was the last one, but the first one was or the third one. The first of 2015 was prepping my body for the second one. Um, so I did get a little bit of cycling in between. Actually, the first surgery was in May. And while I was recovering from that surgery, I got online and signed up for a hundred mile Grand Fondo before I even owned a bike. And oh thought, my well, gosh. Now I'm gonna... <laughs> that, there's my commitment. I'm going to buy a bike because I was very scared of it. Um, I'm going to buy a bike and start cycling. And fell in love with it much to my own surprise um and that was july of 2015 my second surgery was that november and um i couldn't i couldn't do any i was on crutches for 12 weeks and then they said i could ride on a trainer only for another two months so that's when i bought my or actually i was gifted my boyfriend gave me a Wahoo kicker snap for Christmas and um, I started looking at what can I do to make me not go insane because the thought of riding a stationary trainer was, I thought it was going to be torturous like a treadmill for a runner, but mm -hmm. someone told me about Zwift and, you know, like, like all of us on here do, I'm sure I, I became addicted to that. Um, right. And actually while i was shopping for my trainer i had two friends tom and missy collins um that told me hey the, that program that you're looking at doing they're doing a competition to find a pro and i remember reading an article about zwift academy and i thought that is so cool you know it never ever crossed my mind that i would even be somebody who would be considered but i just thought well whenever that comes around you know I'll do it, and, and I remember the sure. day that there was an that there was an announcement about it, and I told my friend Missy, I said, "Hey, remember what you and Tom told me? I signed up for that program today." And yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> but Amazing! Was, um, a lot of surprises along the way. Sure, and I remember those days. It was around the same time I started Zwifting too, yeah. and I remember seeing you out there, and you were one of my first friends on Zwift. Yeah. <laughs> so you were up super early um, every day there. So it's really yeah, been... Yeah, I was still uh, working full time. So it was like yeah. four in the morning was a typical start time for me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's, that's early. So, um, so Leah, before then, let's say you started when you or maybe when you were training with Zwift Academy, how about your experience outside of Zwift, what, what, what were some of the things that you were doing? Were you racing at all? Were you doing group rides? What was your cycling life like? Um, racing, no. I did my first race. Uh, I'd be lying if I said for sure I knew the month, but it was the summer, the late spring, early summer, or maybe midsummer of 2016. So before Zwift, because I had just, it was just from July to November. So I had done some group rides and a few fondos, but I didn't really know, I didn't really know for sure if I wanted to race. I think there was a bit of, um, you know, when, when you go from something being very much your identity, which not that I was known by anyone really on a world or probably even national scale, but to everyone in my hometown, to myself, I was a runner. I was that runner girl from Little Rock, you know? So I think it was like, I needed the cycling to keep me sane, but I wasn't sure I even wanted to be competitive with it. I just wanted to be, I just wanted to stay fit. Um, mm -hmm. And then after doing, signing up for Zwift Academy, and I started doing some of the workouts and think it, you know, it kind of, I hadn't done prior to Zwift Academy, I didn't do any Zwift events. I literally would just get on every morning and ride for two hours and <laughs> made some friends, but it wasn't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I probably went for some KOMs or some sprint segments. I honestly don't remember, but I'm sure I did, <laughs> but it wasn't, I didn't give any thought to road racing until things started getting going with the Academy and, you know, kind of woke mm -hmm. up that competitive bug. And then I did my first road races um, that year. But I think when I showed up in Mallorca last December, I had done less, I think I'd done about four road races. 
and, wow. and the largest field was 15 people. You know, it was like most of yeah. them, the women's fields around here, we're trying, we're growing, but um, if you get 15 in a women's field, that's pretty great. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, and for, for those of you listening who are not familiar with, uh, Mallorca means that that was the camp uh, that the finalists got to attend for the first Swift Academy, right? So that's when yes. uh, it was yeah, the top three. Yeah, that was the final three. So sorry, mm -hmm. I was forgetting that Swift Academy might be a foreign concept to a few people. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Okay, so then how about Swift Academy itself? How so when you went to do the workouts? Yeah, they were super hard, and, and it was quite a long academy. It was a uh, I don't even know how many months, it was, maybe. It's, it was June to September for the qualification. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think I'd be curious to talk to someone who's been through. Did you do both? No, I did this yourself? this year. Okay. Um, because it was a lot longer. Um, you know, we had 27 workouts where I think this year they had eight. But, some, but the workouts this year... You know, I remember a few key killers from last year, but some of the workouts that they had you guys doing in the qualification rounds were things that we didn't see maybe ever or until the last week of the semifinals. So I think they kind of pared it down and really focused on those specific sessions that they were going to be able to you know, put into whatever formula they use to calculate whatever they're looking for to get the get to the next level. Mm -hmm. Sure. Did I just so, miss yeah, the question? Let's... I started rambling and I forgot. <laughs> no, 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 the, yeah, no, no. The question was the workouts. Were they super hard then for oh. somebody who were? Yeah, um, some yes and some no. I mean, some were very doable. And uh, I mean, I remember especially in the first block, there was, we had kind of three blocks that I remember and um, or maybe I just broke it down that way in the 27 workouts like the first nine the second nine the third nine but it seemed like I remember them being tough but doable like trying to manage your time to get through it there were some times that I did a workout in the morning and then if I knew I had something planned going on whatever that week there were a few days that I did the second workout that evening after work and Wow. I don't know if I think that that to me tells me you know, there were some of the, some of them were of a lower intensity, um, mm -hmm. but there were some that were really hard. I mean, there was there was maybe one or two. I know I had to repeat a handful of them to get the stars I wanted. <laughs> you can get you had oh. you had to get seventy five percent passing. You get little stars yeah. for each segment of the workout, and there was there was one I'm not sure if I ever passed. I truly can't remember, but. I do remember it was workout number nine. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah, there was some challenge okay. there. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, we hear we heard some of that uh, in this year too, and of course, you know, there's different levels of skills and experience within the academy of all the participants. But let's move on then to your pro life. Okay. Um, <laughs> what are what were for for this season that just ended, what were your favorite races? Like maybe the favorite first, the first and the second favorite races, and why? Um, I think if I had to pick one overall, I would say, and I'm kind of cheating, so I'm going to pick a tour rather than one specific stage. But um, tour of Lotto Thuringen Ladies Tour, and because that was for me. The first time, and it was very close to the end of the season. I think after that, I only had two two more tours and one more one day race. But that was the first race where I felt like we had some victories within the team that I actually contributed to. You know, um, I mean, if for my if I was talking about a selfish progression, I saw a lot of change as well. But there was some like the the um, the Lotto Belgium Tour, which was my last last race with the team, um, I personally progressed quite a bit, but I don't. I didn't feel like I was of much value to my teammates, partially because we were working with a smaller team there, but also because there was a, sta a couple of stages. I just I didn't 
do as well getting into the position I needed to be in to be valuable to my teammates. So um, Turingen was where I really felt like I could see a marked improvement both in myself and that I was able to be a participant in the plans of my teammates. Um, second after that, I guess second after that probably would be the final stage of Lotto Belgium Tour, just because it was the best that I've ever personally finished um, in an event. And finally, you know, I thought throughout the season that um, some of the more, some of the races with more climbing might be strengths for me, but I just had incidents where the first real hilly race that I did, I crashed and was unable to finish. And then I'm at La Course, which I thought I was going to love because it was all uphill, but I'm still working on improving my descending. And La Course actually started with a 15 kilometer descent. And so I was dropped from the beginning. And the rest of the race was <laughs> was good, but it was like the damage was, I was too far back at that point. That, mm -hmm. so, so that final stage at Lotto Belgium was, you know, we went over the mirror three times and just every time I was able to move up. So it just was really feeling strong and um, kind of playing the game. Mm -hmm. How fast do you guys go on the descents? I mean, I have an idea, but how fast were people <laughs> when, going? <laughs> when, <laughs> when I got dropped, because I went back to look and see, am I really taking this hill completely as a weenie? Like, I know it's my fault, but was, was it like, am I doing... I thought maybe was I taking those turns at, you know, 15, 20 miles an hour. And I hit a peak speed that day of 50 miles an hour. Oh my gosh, 50. Stuff. Yeah. And, um, and so I looked up some of the other women who I knew were, uh, did not get dropped. And I saw, I mean, who knows if there's a hundred percent accuracy to what's showing up on Strava. You know, I know that can be, mm -hmm but I saw a peak speed of 67 miles an hour. <laughs> so that is insane. That, that's a long descent. And to someone who's comfortable descending in a bunch, there was really only one hairpin. So I think that's an extreme, but the point is they go fast. <laughs> they go right. really fast and, and they ride close. I mean, it does string out a bit on the descent, but <laughs> it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a challenge to be honest, you know, to wrap my mind around, I don't, I don't, nobody wants to hit the ground at that speed, but I guess the difference oh. is you have to yeah. be confident that, that you won't. And I mean, on occasion it does happen, but, um, I have yeah. to think that it takes time. I don't know that I would ever be comfortable at that speed. And, it's just, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's, I think it does take time. And yeah. I think, you know, even to say, I thought, well, shoot, you know, if I got dropped going 50 miles an hour, I don't feel as bad because I know there was a point in time where you couldn't have convinced me to descend that fast. And now I've been on a climb where, where I was so low, but where I've gone mm -hmm. over 60 and had fun doing it. But I think there's a whole difference in just spending time on the bike, getting comfortable, going around the descents that are not just straight point to point and then comes in doing it in close proximity to others. So yeah, it'll take some time. <laughs> Maybe sure. I'll get yeah. there. I hope. And so yeah, how about your hardest race that you felt was just the hardest for you and why was that so hard? The Giro d'Italia. Um, oh man, because that just physically and mentally I don't want to say it broke me because honestly um I didn't I didn't choose to stop <laughs> but um the Giro was it was late in the season so I I you know in my mind I thought I've improved some and and the roads actually compared to some of the roads in Belgium and, and other places that are much more narrow and much more windy the roads at the Giro d'Italia are actually pretty open. So I think I certainly didn't go into it thinking I was going to be a key player, but I didn't rule out that I might be able to ride with my teammates um, and, and play more of a role. It was my first 
actual world tour race. So I don't, just real briefly, because I don't know if everyone on here is familiar, but that's, you know, world tour is like the highest level. And then they go to mm -hmm. 1.1 or 1.2 races and 2.1 or 2.2 based on the number of days and the level of the competition in the race. So I only raced three races during the season that were actually world tour events and the Giro was my first. So my first time on that stage and I'm going into, you know, the most, the wow. highest profile women's race there is. Um, and the world tour events are, they really are another level, you know, it's like where I could be in other races. And if you, if you have a bad start or if you get popped off the back or it's a, a course just isn't for you and you find yourself alone, you usually have other people that are kind of at your level and you can manage to work your way up where I found at the zero, there was just no room for error because they're all that good. It's not like, well, there's a few others no. that are kind of new and struggling like me, like they're mm -hmm. all that good. So it just was, um, yeah, I found myself popped off in the back and chasing for long periods of time. <laughs> and they give a very generous, um, time break. You know, it's, a uh, you can, you can take 20% each day of the time of the leader and add it to your time and they're going to let you finish. So basically, you know, my, my thought on it was as long as you want to keep, keep getting out here and getting your ass kicked day after day after day, they'll let you because you could literally finish like 40 minutes behind the field and probably not be cut. So, mm -hmm. you know, every day I'd, I'd go out with kind of, okay, well, today's a new day. Today will be better. And, you know, some days it was, but I know, you know, it's like one day it was a 120 kilometer race and I didn't get dropped till 80 K, but it's like, you still had 40 K and that 40 K is really long and really lonely when you're right. by yourself <laughs> and sure. you're already fatigued and you've already got three days of racing in your legs. So, but I wanted, I always wanted to start again. And I think the most devastating thing was, um, that we kind of had a plan of, you know, obviously I was to go out and give my best every day, but if there got to be a point in a race where I was no longer, where I had lost contact, then it was kind of decided that it was better for me, if that happened, to save my legs and start fresh for the next day. So to finish within the time cut, but not to like, you know, don't waste yourself trying to finish six minutes back instead of, 15 minutes back. Mm -hmm. um, so on day six, um, I'd found myself alone pretty early, but I knew I was about a lap and a half into a four lap race. And, but there were 20 K laps. No, it was longer than that. Anyway, point being when I came through the second time, um, I was stopped, which, I mean, I was well on any pace I would have needed to be to do within the time cut of the leader, but because it was a circuit, um, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that going into it. So it was just kind of devastating of now I don't even, now I don't, I'm, my, I'm done. I don't get to try tomorrow because I was just too far off. So it was just hard. It was just really hard. Right. I, I love racing. Um, I, the, I just love having any opportunity to to improve and to hope it will go better. And I mean, if I look at what the next few stages were, it probably would have been three more stages of the same thing, but still it was really hard at the time. And then to feel sure. like, you know, feel like, oh, I don't, I don't deserve to be here. But everybody knew going in what my experience was, but it was just, it was hard. It was hard. I'm sure it was hard. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's just amazing to me how you jumped into world tour so quickly <laughs> <laughs> right i mean it it's, was terrifying it's, i am sure but, and and go ahead oh i was just gonna say but but at the same time the giro d'italia was such a cool experience so i was you know i had to kind of pinch myself well i'm still pinching myself daily but i remember just being there thinking 
there's just being amazed by everything, everything about it. I mean, I just, even the things that make the Giro maybe for some a pain in the butt, it was all fascinating to me. You know, it's like just the whole rhythm of moving from place to place every day. And, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you have your breakfast, you bag there outside your hotel room door, and the bags get picked up by team mechanic or Swanee, and they're on their way to the next place while you're on your way to the start line. And, mm-hmm. and kind of the, I don't, I don't know if Russian roulette would be an accurate way to say it, but the roll the dice, just, just not never knowing what kind of city you were going to be in next, what your accommodation was going to look like next. Like, it was... It was so funny, like, and just to see the different landscapes of Italy from the north to the south was so cool. Um, mm-hmm. I just, I loved everything about it, except, except for the heartbreak. <laughs> but, but even with that, it was really, really an amazing experience. Sylvia, how, so speaking of these hard races and, you know, just being a world tour, how do you manage pre-race stress? <laughs> Why? Or pre-race anxiety. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because we were talking about, um, or I saw you had mentioned something about about having a ritual, and what's funny is I don't really have I have a routine that I've become accustomed to, but I think because it was kind of if this I hope this makes sense. It was a routine that I was trying to slip into and understand and fit into rather than something, you know, like with running as I evolved over different years of competition and got more experience, there was things that I decided made sense. You know, what, like from what I ate to what socks I wore to my warm up routine, um, I kind of developed my own routine where this was kind of you're stepping into the atmosphere and the daily experience of the best and I had no clue like I hadn't even developed a routine really for my little podunk Arkansas races so I sure didn't (laughs) know what was best on the world tour scene so I think it became just more of kind of me watching and learning and adapting So there's definitely kind of routines that you go through, but there's nothing that I feel like, oh, well, I always do. I mean, I guess, yeah, like, you know, for running, I had my lucky socks. Well, my my beautiful uniform is something I don't have to choose now, and I love it. But I can't really say that's, like, a routine of my own. Um, And I have specific things I like to eat, but when you're traveling, you don't – you have to be a little bit flexible because you don't always have exactly the same thing. (laughs) Do you so, get do you get um, the food do you get like food from the support crew or is it just do they prepare your yes. food? Oh, they okay. oftentimes pre- prepare our lunch because of either training or racing. We're usually not at the hotel, so a lot of times, you know, when we finish, we'll have a recovery drink and then they'll have something prepared for us to take to eat until you can get back to the hotel and have. A proper dinner later but and, mm-hmm. and i actually love that food i love what this one is um prepare and i feel so spoiled i think it's Let's go give, know, a, give us an example of what that would be rice and eggs my guess um <laughs> sometimes a lot of times it's either rice or shoot there's this other grain and i can never remember what it's called and i always want to call it farro but it's not but um it's a brown grain uh, that I can't remember what it is, but that, and then there might be like fixings put on it, like some tomato, avocado, um, olive oil, salt and pepper, nothing. It's not anything super adventurous, but mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily super, well, I, I will, I love, I'm a, I'm a foodie. I love trying anything, but as far as like when it gets into season and I'm in a routine, I can eat the same thing every day and not really be bored. So it's not so super like, you don't get a whole lot of variation, but we get these um, egg and oat frittatas that are really good, and they're usually cooked with either curry or a bit of cayenne, so I love those. Um, but yeah, it was a new concept for me to, you know, you don't realize 
how much time, or maybe you do realize, but how much time is spent in the kitchen trying to train or even around work? Like how much time do you spend preparing food and cleaning up after mm-hmm. cooking food? And I, I will be honest, it feels hugely spoiled <laughs> to, to go to camps or races and have your lunch ready for you when you get done training. <laughs> right, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. and so so yeah. really, it, it's it's uh, you ride and then you eat and then you rest, right? You recover and you sleep and then you do it all over again. And uh, then usually a massage in there too. This and I'm making this sound like I'm probably you know some of the girls always say, well, we're glad you got to see the not glamorous side. And trust me, there is there is not glamorous side to it. But some of the things that to me as a 38 year old woman that I've been living alone and doing all of my stuff myself mm-hmm. for so long that I'm like, sure. I can't help but think that I help but feel a little bit spoiled when, when that part of it to me feels glamorous, you know, being able to take right. off your kit and put it in a bag and you give it to somebody at the end and then you have clean laundry at dinner. It's like, really, this is pretty great. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, obviously mm-hmm. there's, there's there's not glamorous and really tough times too so yeah and so, so going back a little bit of uh of pre-race anxiety how about on you know we talked a little bit about routine and some uh-huh. people have different routines how about um mentally do you have any because for example i know some people who do meditation right at the start yeah. line there's some sort of mantra maybe that they repeat to themselves. Do you have anything like that? I pray, I pray at the start line every time. But meditation, um, I have experimented with it. And if I'm really being honest, the reason that I don't still do it every single day was that I didn't want to pay for the app. That sounds so cheap, but y'all, I'm a pro athlete and we don't make good money. So, um, <laughs> But Alexis Ryan, my teammate, actually is big into meditation. Um, and she had suggested an app to me and I, I really did like it just for oftentimes we're traveling anywhere from I think a short day maybe 30 minutes but sometimes two hours from the hotel to the start so it's a lot of time for your mind to go wild and shoot off all kinds of crazy energy if you don't kind of have it under control so usually I'll try to um, if I'm not doing the meditation sort of a self meditation since I'm a little bit familiar with how it goes you know it's just a lot of kind of focusing on your breathing and trying not to let your mind go all over the place and go crazy. Yeah. Um, and maybe put music on or if I, if I need to resort to, I try not to get too sucked into social media, but I, but I, but I'm not good at not getting sucked into it. So a lot of times I do find it to be a good distraction in route. Mm-hmm. If I don't, if I can't seem to do the meditation thing, just, keeping your mind off of thinking too much about all the things in the race. Because once you've studied the race course, you know, we will study it. We'll have a team meeting. We'll talk about it. Um, But all the things that I tend to worry about are things that you can't control until you're in the race. Um, So sitting and thinking, overthinking the things that could go wrong is never a good idea. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I try to focus on positive things or just to keep my mind away from what we're about to do all together. Makes sense. So how about your training? You know, this is something I'm very curious about also as a coach. If you compare your training today, how's your training like today compared to what it was before? Um, just sure. give us an idea um, what sort of things that you do in a week, how many hours, etc. Yeah, so... Um, it all is very dependent upon what part of the season. Um, I know like in the once when you're doing the building season, that's mo- a lot of base miles, but you know, occasionally there might be a workout thrown in there. I know one thing that surprised me, I was thinking coming from, because I came from training where because of my full-time job, I had to break things up. I mean, I did do a long ride on the weekends, but otherwise during the week, Sometimes I would just do one session in the morning, but a lot of times I would do two hours in the morning and then I might do another two hours or an hour and a half. 
outside. You know, typically my lifting in the morning because it was so early. And then if the weather was nice, I'd do an outdoor ride in the evening. Or if not, I'd get back on Zwift. Um, and I didn't know that when I first started, and I don't know if this is the same for everyone. We're not all coached by the same person. Everyone can have their own coach. Um, but my coach had me doing most of my sessions. He never, I don't think he ever, aside from race days of an afternoon race, scheduled a double. So it was like a lot of four and five hour days. Um, which that's where, you know, people would be like, oh, you're going to have so much free time now that you get to be a professional cyclist. And I'm just like, no, because you put in a five hour day, five right. hours of On a bike. time. Plus, you know, if you ever stop to use the bathroom or whatever, by the time you load up and then unload and clean up, I mean, that's easily a seven hour day. And you hadn't mm -hmm. even stretched or done any core or <laughs> anything else yet. So um, I was, I was surprised at that. I actually liked it. I like, I like big volume. I mean, I've been a marathoner. I'm used to long hours of training. So I didn't mind that. Um, more rest days than I was used to, which that was the nice thing about when you spend three consecutive days of four to five hours of saddle time, what I would usually find was that by that fourth day, I was welcoming a rest day, just mentally as much as anything. Um, so I typically would have three days on, one day off. Um, and then as it got and closer to the race, it might be two days on, one day off. Right, right. So then, and on the days on, long uh -huh. days in the saddle, how about intensity, the sorts of workouts that yeah. the rest of us do? Do you do that too? You know, sweet spot training or sprint training, or, or is that all part of your outdoor ride and you do it all out there on the road? Well, I did. I, I think that may change a little bit this year. Um, last year, once I made the team, I was doing everything that I could outdoors just because my greatest weakness then and probably still now was the handling. It was just hours on the bike that I didn't have anywhere near the people who'd been doing it since they were six or 10 years old. So mm -hmm. um, I do think there's value if you're doing a controlled interval session. Um, Zwift is really good for that because you can plug it in and not have to be looking down at your power meter thinking about those values or, you know, wanting to hold this consistent power, but there's variations in the road that just make it really challenging where if the goal actually is just to hold those sessions of power, Zwift is such a great tool for that. Um, so I think, I don't know for sure yet, I'm actually changing coaches. Um, and I, I think that my new coach will is, um, He's known for using Zwift very successfully. So I think, I, I, I don't know for sure. It's a very new transition, but I think that I probably will have some Zwift specific sessions. But mm -hmm. yes, to answer your question, I guess, about do we do the same things? Um, there, and again, it depends on the point in the season. Like early on, there was more of the longer intervals, um, five, 10, 15, 20 minute, you know, more tempo type sessions. And then as the season goes on, it gets into, it got into a lot more specific where workouts that I tended to do often were um, like peak power intervals where you're doing 10 times one minute at, um, at 100 to 150% of FTP with two minute recovery <laughs> or three sets of five times 30 seconds at, um, 150 to 200 FTP. Okay. Per, yep. Sorry, that explosive FTP. side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also with two minute recoveries and then like 15 minutes between sets. So those okay. were two of like two really common workouts for me to see. Um, but so yes. And then um, the over unders type of thing where it would be like on a climb, you know, go at 80% for five minutes and then drop down to. 60% or 70% for two minutes, you know, so it's mm -hmm. where you're not, you're getting a recovery, but not like a chill, totally chill recovery. Yes. So yeah, you have to hold that floor. As far as yeah. if that's, you know, I didn't have 
Zwift Academy workouts are literally the only thing I would have to compare it to. I didn't, on my own, I had never, I hadn't been on a bike long enough to have tried to develop workouts for myself. So I don't, it's hard for me to say, is it comparable to what I used to do? Because there was no what I used to do. But Got it. It is comparable to certain things you do on Zwift. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So if uh, anyone watching, if you have questions on Discord or Facebook, type them in. A lot of comments here, Leah, on, you know, Beth is saying, Beth York, that you're uh -huh. so fierce mentally and physically. <laughs> Amy LeVang, Richard Lovelock, everybody um, listening in here and enjoying your insights. It's all good. Good. So question, another question for you then. Um, now that cycling is your job, <laughs> is it less, is it less fun? No, <laughs> no that's, you know, and, and I was saying this to someone recently and I said, I don't ever want this to come across as that I don't take it seriously. I do take it seriously and trust me, I, I don't like being behind the curve and I'm not just floating along thinking, woohoo, isn't this fun, a free ride, however, um, it's hard for me still when people, when I'll meet someone, you know, completely outside of the cycling realm who I can't say, well, I'm the Zwift Academy winner and them have a clue what I mean. When someone says, what do you do? It's still really strange for me to say, well, I'm a professional cyclist <laughs> because it feels like, it feels like this fantasy life. And it's, mm -hmm. there were times of massive struggle and times that I thought, I really don't know how I'm going to complete this year, but now here I am very willfully and thankfully doing it again. So obviously, you know, I, I loved it, but it feels a bit like, it feels a bit like I'm on the second year of hiatus from like the life that I had. Like I, it seems inevitable that I will go back to that. And maybe that's not true because I never would have thought I would be here. But it's just, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around that this is my job. <laughs> mm -hmm, it's, sure. It's, it's, it's wild. Yeah. So looking at then the next year, having this first year under your belt, looking at next year, you said you, you're you changing coaches. Uh huh. Any other things that you see for 2018 that might be different or you're aiming, you're aiming to be different? Yeah, well, um, this hasn't been vocalized by my team, but I'm certain for it to be true, and I certainly hold true for myself, that um, I have a much greater expectation of myself. Not to say that, oh, well, now I have a year, so I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to be able to tear it up because I'm so experienced. No, but I think I, I was very lenient, very forgiving of myself when things weren't perfect. Like, that, like... I definitely got upset by it. I mean, <laughs> I, I won't tell you that I never had tears last year of, over things just being so challenging and so frustrating. But at the end of the day, I had to kind of remind myself, you came into this as a cat four racer with five races under your belt, like anybody else would be in the same boat. So I think I gave myself a lot of grace with that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, fact still is, that now I'm, I have one year of racing in a pro peloton. I'm still very inexperienced, but I think you kind of have to let that go at some point. It's like, I can't, I can't let it be a safety net for myself to just say, well, you're really only this. It's like, so I think I'll be putting a lot, I'll be holding myself much more accountable for, you know, I don't feel like I, there has to come a point where it's not just okay for me to kind of say, well, you're new because otherwise you, I think I can, you can prevent yourself from ever really making a big step forward. So, um, and I know the team is counting on me. I mean, there are lots of women who would be beyond thrilled to have my place. And I really feel fortunate to have been given another shot. So I just think I have to prove, I, I want to prove that it was a right decision um, and that I have made strides. So, um, there's certainly been no 
threats made to me or anything by my team. And we have our team camp in um, early December. And I guess that's when I'll really get to sit down face to face with our, our sports director and team manager and hear from them. But I mean, that's what I expect is that it's going to be, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a new Swift Academy champion. And, um, and I, I hope that I can be an asset to that person just as far as helping them. I'm looking at the level of experience of the 10 semifinalists and I think they all could handily leave me in the dust as far as race experience. But I just think being able to handle the mental and emotional side of it, I hope that I can um, be helpful for them and help them to feel um, welcome and not so nervous. And um, I would, I'm very happy to be able to be there for that person. I, and I'm sure that person will be very happy to have you there. So, I hope so. so two <laughs> questions. Two two questions from that. Um, one is, and I'll just tell you what the two questions are, and perhaps you can kind of string them together when you answer. One comes from okay. Richard Lovelock, which is related to what we're talking about. So, how was it? You know, how was the? How did the Peloton feel when they had a new team member who? Um, came in in an unusual method, you know, you came in through Zwift versus, I guess, the usual um, entry method that you see in the pro ranks. That's number one. And number uh -huh. two, as you will be experienced in being in that situation um, and you'll be able to mentor the new Zwift Academy graduate in, in this year, what advice would you give uh -huh. to the ladies that are now the uh, semifinalists? Um. Okay, so how did the Peloton react? Um, I think everyone who verbalized anything to me was very supportive. Um, I don't doubt, I do, and I don't, this isn't one of those stories where I'm talking about someone specific and I just don't want them to know that I know. I don't know, I didn't hear nasty comments, but it wouldn't surprise me even a little to know that some people just like, oh, that Zwift girl doesn't know what she's doing. She's an idiot. She can't ride a bike. Like it wouldn't surprise me, and I can't even argue with it. <laughs> you know, it's I'm learning <laughs> on the fly. So, um, actually, I did hear one, and I wouldn't even say it was nasty, but there was an article that came out about uh, some person telling their teammates, "Don't follow her," you know. And I've told myself the same thing about other riders. That you know, you get to know riders in the peloton and there's sketchy wheels. And I sure tried to not be one, but I don't know what I look like from the back. And um, I'm sure that, I'm sure that some people didn't want to be close to me. <laughs> um, but the feedback that I got was always positive. Um, I had a few ladies, you know, just sometimes during the race even, they'd come on Leah, you know, move up, move up. And I was just like, how does this person even know me? And I thought, well, they have, they have to know the Zwift story because otherwise they just don't know where they even know me. Um, and I had a few stop me and just say, hey, I think what you're doing is really, really admirable. And like, you've done a great job. You know, they were always very supportive. So that was nice. Um, and sorry, what was the other question? Oh, what would I tell the girls? Um, I think the biggest thing, and this is so easy to say and hard to do, but be confident like i think people and i've been told this a number of times this isn't me having to just big knowledge but it's just like you know i've talked to my teammates about you guys can just move through the move through the peloton so flawlessly and you just don't like you just and they said you know people they said other riders will sense that you're nervous and if they can sense that you're not confident they'll take your wheel every time because they can mm -hmm. and they know you'll give it to them so I think the biggest thing is as far as racing is to be confident because the more that happens, the more you feel like, oh, I can't take a wheel. And it's like, instead you have to, you have to know, like you have to believe that you belong there and you have to ride like you belong there. And that's not gonna make it always go perfect, but it's much better than going in thinking that you don't. Um, and again, I think that's very, that, yeah, that's that valuable. Itself, I, I think it'll be easier for these girls because 
most of them, if not all of them, have quite a bit of experience. I know there's, you know, yeah, there's some pretty solid um, race experience, and, and I've seen a few impressive titles, you know, world champion time trial, or masters time trialist, and a um, red hook crit winner. I mean, people who are doing those things have big power and mad skills, so, um, yeah, I don't know if they'll even struggle with that, but I think that would be the best advice I can is get comfortable in that group and, and ride with confidence. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. Coming from you, Leah. Um, there's a, uh, let's see, is there a question here on Facebook? There's some comments just, uh, yep, that you'll see, you'll see when we're done here. So, Any, were there any, um, so let's, what surprised you the most about joining a pro mm -hmm. Peloton? What was the one thing that you just, let's say, let's say, you know, you're a Zwift Academy graduate, you're going through it, you're probably reading about it, you're probably trying to learn about it, and then you go to the camp um, for the finalists and everything, but what was the one thing that, surprise you the most? Um, that's such a hard question. And I've been asked that so many times throughout the season that you'd think I'd have a little canned answer. But what, what, what I've always said, and I kind of will hold to is, I don't know that there was a big moment of surprise as far as like, oh, this shocked me. I didn't expect it to be this way. Because I had no idea. I had no expectation. So it wasn't like, oh, wow, I really thought it would be like this. It was just like, I was very impressed. And I was amazed, you know, and, and I was excited. But I think, you know, one thing that I found super impressive is just the way these girls, like, the absolute beauty of the terrifying Peloton, like the way that they can all read each other and the way that they can just seamlessly, you know, on the fly with a few comments in the microphone or maybe even not because half the time with the static, I don't get the message <laughs> clearly anyway, but they can transition and know where they need to be and what they need to do. And I know that just comes with time, but it's so impressive and how you can lay a plan for the team but there's so many unexpecteds and unknowns that can happen um, that you can't plan out for everyone. You know, you can't say, okay, we're going to protect Hannah today, but if Hannah crashes, this, you, know, you, you just, that's not the way that it goes. It's like, here's, here's what our plan is today. And then there's just like, they just know what to do when something happens. <laughs> and it was, right. that was so, so impressive to me. Um, and again, not surprised, but, um, you know, you hear about, I heard someone say the only way to prepare for being in a pro peloton is to get in the pro peloton. Like there's nothing like it. And I don't know if I would say that's so 100% true. If I was coming from someone who'd worked their way up through cat four to cat one and had actually been in some larger fields. But for me, it was like, wow, to suddenly be on a start line with a hundred women and all of them riding so close and the road is so small, like there is nothing like that. Um, right. So again, I was, I was surprised. I expected it to be overwhelming, but it was, it was, um, mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was a shock. It was, uh, yeah. It must terrifying. be amazing. But I, yeah. It, uh, really, really amazing. Yeah. Scary and amazing so all at once. But I, don't, I don't know what was surprising because, like I said, I just, everything was, it's like I feel like a little kid walking around at Disney World just taking it all in. Although For I'm the sure first time, face, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I looked a bit more scared, but yeah. So what are your races, or the, the, your race goals for 2018? Do you have any sights on that? At this point, um, we, you know, we don't we don't have a set race. Or well, we, I shouldn't say that. There probably is a fairly set race calendar, but we will um, be getting to see that 
at um, team camps. So I don't know what races are planned for me. Um, I will say, I mean, the one, you know, I know that I'll be doing the U.S. Nationals and I'd like to go for a top 10 finish. That might seem lofty, but I know where I was last year and I know the circumstances. So I think it's, um, it's good to aim high. And I think it's um, not completely out of the question if I, if, if some, some things go right and I execute them well. Um, and my big goal with the team is just to be able to be a, be a team player that they can count on. And that sounds, it really, I, I realize that sounds sort of like I'm pussy putting around a goal, but it's just hard to say, you know, I'm not going to be the one that's saying, well, I'm aiming to win Strada Bianchi. <laughs> because I just, I don't, I, I would expect that if I were even riding there, that I would be, wor I would be working for a teammate. Um, mm -hmm. And I am so 100% okay with that. As long as I'm able to deliver on it, I'm good with that. I want to be, I want to be a teammate that, you know, we have 14, sorry, maybe 13, 13 members. When, when somebody sees that I'm one of the six coming, I don't want it to be like, well, we're racing the five today. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want to be a teammate that my team can count on. Um, and then if there's some smaller events, like, of course, I'd love to try for a podium myself, but I think um, my biggest goal is to be to be valuable to my team in whatever respect that is, wherever they need me. They're lucky to have you, Leah. And going oh, back to you. the comment, going back to the comment of, or the question that we had on how the... Uh, the teammates reacted when somebody that came through Zwift joined the, the group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If, I think a, a big, I think the fact that they're doing it again this year and they're going to bring yeah. somebody else in to add to the team in the same way speaks volume, yeah. right? Of their support yes. of the yeah. program. So. I, think so. I think so for sure. And I think, um, you know, my year was the inaugural year. So it was kind of a trial by fire. And I think, I think it was, I hope that it's something they'll continue to do year after year. Um, and I think that it will just get better. And, you know, as there's more explosion, it becomes a more common way to uh, of talent identification that the talent pool is going to get deeper and the community is going to get larger and stronger because it's not, not just great for, I mean, yeah, it's an amazing story and it's a, it's a, it's a great tool for teams to find riders, but it's also just become this unbelievable group of women supporting each other. I mean, and men too, but obviously I'm speaking from experience of the Women's Oath Academy. Um, people who have, have no ambition to be, or I shouldn't say no ambition, they don't, they don't have a, a goal or a desire to be a professional cyclist, but they want that group that will push them to whatever their goal is. And Zwift Academy has really been that. And I think not only does our team see that this is a successful program, but we're also huge proponents of just helping move women's cycling forward. And right. obviously you can see that it's been successful for that. Right, and it's making an impact, right? Zwift Academy, yes. Canyon Strand bringing in, uh, building their female peloton. You have been an inspiration, no doubt, and you still are for all of us. Um, Thank you. And so it's been, we wish you best of luck for 2018. We all Thank support you. and cheer for you. <laughs> you have a big group of fans here. So um, i I'm really I, happy to. Every time to. I get on Zwift, I get the waterfall of ride-ons from Team ODZ, <laughs> and it's the best. It's the best. <laughs> I'm like, here I come. It will just be one Yeah, the bazooka. The <laughs> it's so amazing. It's my favorite. <laughs> so there are a few more questions on Facebook that we won't have time to address here live. And, okay. uh, but perhaps you can take a read through. Yeah. Um, just really I'll glad that you're that. joining, that you joined us today. It's Thank you so fun. much. For and it's, you know, it's like I said, great excuse to get me, get me going early. There. I can't tell you that there isn't a little bit of temptation while I'm not doing training. You know, some days you go, well, if I can make myself stay in bed a bit longer, it's great for me, right? 
and suddenly oh, today yeah. I'm not getting started on mine. So this is this is good. I feel a very productive day coming on. <laughs> Perfect. I'm just gonna say thank you to everyone here. Where's the December camp that you're going to? Koblenz, Germany. Sounds cold, right? <laughs> it does. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of sponsor things we need to do. And um, I think we'll, we'll be training, but it will be more of a team building focused Thing with some cycling built in for fun. I think we're going to do a little bit of mountain biking as well, which is oh wow, really fun for me. Um, yeah, and then we'll have like a proper team um, training camp in February, somewhere warmer. <laughs> awesome. Well, Leah, thanks again. Best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Take everyone for joining. I, I, I have been playing with Cross. <laughs>